He's soon to be inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, former Indiana Pacer player, and he was also an executive. Mel Daniels, how you doing, Mel? Fine, right, you sir. Great. So, are you getting ready uh, for the Derby? No, no, no. That's a thoroughbred, totally different equine sport. I do rodeo events, um, not the not the flat track. So, what horses do you do you raise out there? I raise quarter horses. So you go to uh, you go to Rio Dosa Downs and things like that. No, this is like uh, for bell racing and pole bending contesting. You know, rope horses, calf horses, that type of thing. How long have you been doing that? Uh, about 35 years. How did you get into uh, raising horses? Well, I, I I was at the University of New Mexico. And, you know, down there, semi-desert type of affair. And one day, uh, my roommate and I went horseback riding. And I said to myself, if I, was, if I were able to own a horse, I certainly would. I uh, had no idea I owned so many. But nevertheless, I do. And I enjoy it thoroughly. My diversion. They had a horse big enough to accommodate you. Do they have a horse? Did, did yeah, the when you when, world do have produced horses to accommodate me? But then it's not about really the size; it's about uh, confirmation and the build of the horse. How did you end up going to New Mexico for college? Uh, my college, co- uh, my high school coach chose the University of New Mexico for me. <laughs> That's why I went to New Mexico. And besides, I like Bob King; he's a good guy. Coach, man. How big of an adjustment was it from growing up in Detroit to going out at what I would assume would be the middle of nowhere? Well, it's like growing up in a mansion and going to the projects. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Sound, th- sounds thinking? like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I mean, life is full of adjustments. And those are one of the adjustments I had to make. If I was going to grow and, and mature and deal with life as it came to me. So. And then you go play for the Minnesota Muskies? For I was a drafted by the Minnesota Muskies, and I was drafted by the uh, Cincinnati Royals. Were you hoping to play for the Royals? Because what, the Royals had Oscar Robinson at that time, right? Yeah, but they only offered me $15,000, and two and two are still four. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much did Minnesota offer you? Thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars was fifteen thousand dollar bonus. So your mom didn't raise a stupid kid. Uh, no, I was. That's one of the reasons I was in school. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, know the difference. That that made it way too easy. As well, far as far really. decision goes, I would think. Not, not, yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a simple matter. You know. Yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't concerning myself with. I know I love to play basketball. Both uh, situations gave me an opportunity to play basketball, but one was paying more. That was a simple deal. And then you win the rookie of the year with the Pacers there. Did you think, you know what, this is going to be easy? Pardon? When you won the rookie of the year in the ABA, did you think, you know what, this is going to be easy? No, not really. I didn't, you know, the rookie of the year was something that happened after the season. I mean, I, I was, my whole thing with accolades is you do your job as efficiently as possible, you know. Whatever happens after that, happens, you know. But all you know inside in yourself is doing your job. And I love to play basketball. I love my teammates. So that was part of the program. Now, during your rookie season, could you say to yourself, I fit in here. This this isn't that big of a, a jump. No, it wasn't about that. It was about playing basketball. It was just about playing but I didn't look at it as an evaluation. I looked at it as it was a for me the opportunity to do, continue to do something that I love. And I was being paid for it. So, you know. What was the talent level difference between the ABA and NBA at that time? I, I To me, there there wasn't any difference. Uh, uh, the ABA was more of an up-tempo game, uh, uh, running early offense, uh, uh, side pick and rolls to three. You know, the ABL uh, introduced a three-point shot. Uh, the American Basketball Association perfected it. The guys like Billy Keller, Louis Dampard, uh Fred Lewis, uh, Daryl Carrier, you know. So, so it was just, not, it's just it was about playing basketball and being uh, uh, as again as efficient as possible. And they had that red, white, and blue basketball that, that said this is going to be fun. No, it said this is a, this is a real 
probably the blue basketball is different from the brown one. That's all that was. You know, it was no, it was the, it was a livelier ball. It was easy to see on TV the whole nine yards. You know, still same ball, same same amount of air, <laughs> same circumference, same deal. You, know. you had some tough centers to go against and power forwards. You had a future Hall of Famers and Dan Issel, Artis Gilmore. I mean, it seemed like the ABA had all the best big men. Well, I, 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 we had a lot of big men again, and and and, and it was a test every night. Uh, you know, when the merger happened, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the first All Star game, I think it was twelve or thirteen guys from the American Basketball Association made it out of twenty four. So that says something about the talent. Who was the toughest guy you had to go against in the ABA? Zelmo Baby, because he was older, uh, wiser, not a very good athlete, but he understood how to play uh, effectively on the interior. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, you know how to use your body, lower body, uh, your hands, your upper body. How to displace people uh, on the interior, offensively and defensively. So he was he was a tough competitor, and also I learned a lot from him. What do you mean the Big Z wasn't a, a good athlete? I remember him when he played in the NBA with the Hawks. He, he always struck me as being pretty good. What do you think is good though? See, that's 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 the problem. What do you think is a good athlete? He played underneath the basket. He wasn't a big leaper. Okay. You know he, what I'm saying? He just knew where to be? <laughs> he knew where to be and when to be there. You it, know, it's running, like... uh, lateral quickness, you know, jumping ability. There's a lot of things going to athleticism. There's a lot of things going to best. Larry Bird wasn't a good athlete, but he had a basket, high basketball IQ that kind of separated him. Okay. And he could shoot it from distance. Magic Johnson against Larry Bird one-on-one. It would be interesting because Magic was the better athlete, but I think Bird was more well-rounded. Well, I don't know if Magic was that much better of an athlete, but they both had high basketball IQs. That separates Michael Jordan. When you have a high basketball IQ and, and extraordinary, extraordinary athleticism, you have Michael Jordan, you have Kobe Bryant, you have uh, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, those types of people. And there's a difference, a major difference that people don't really understand. Okay. And then there was a guy named Bill Bridges who was not particularly big, no. But he he could rebound the heck out of the ball. So could Wesley also. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's there's you know understanding what you're there for, being efficient in the things that you do. It separate guys. Make some either uh, 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 um, Dennis Rodman, lightweight, but he get to the basket. Great anticipation skill. Charles Barkley, what's he about six four? But that guy could flat out rebound. He could, he could, he he played both ends of the floor extremely well. There are guys, special guys, and Charles is one of those special guys that could get it done at both ends of the floor effectively. And early in his career, Charles was not the wide body that he became later in his career either. Oh no, no, and 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 and, and I can't think of his name, but Charles Barkley and and um, Chuck Person weren't the best basketball player on Auburn's team. And I can't think of his name, but he blew out his knee. So, I mean, it's just doing what you do and doing it the best you possibly can. Question. Everybody talks about the Bulls with Pippen and Jordan. What a great twosome they were. But what people forget is in that 87 draft when the Bulls took Pippen or traded for Pippen, Reggie Miller was part of that draft. Could you imagine Reggie Miller and Michael Jordan as teammates? Uh, yeah, but I don't know. You know, if Reggie would have been Reggie and Michael would have been Michael. I mean, it might, they would have been the same, but there would have, there would have been some type of conflict because they, they if Michael's game was way up there and Reggie's game was way up. Who do you want to shoot the ball at the end of the game? You know, who who do you want to take the last shot? So you see what I'm saying? I think the way it happened, it happened perfectly. Yeah. Michael was in Chicago and Reggie was us. Yeah, they wouldn't need to change the rules to allow two basketballs on the court at the same time, I think. Well, I don't know if they would do that, but certainly they would have they, they, there was some type of conflict because I know both of them, and I know that you know at the end of the game, you know a lot of guys say they want the ball. They wanted it. They had to have it because they, they think they took the responsibility of taking the last shot, like Roger Brown. You know, guys like that. 
wants it. They don't. They don't. They don't pretend to want it. They they wanted the ball. So, how well do you think your Pacers would have done against NBA teams if you had been afforded that opportunity? Well, the year that uh, the year that the Knicks won it and we won it, we played them an exhibition game. Uh, Red Hulsa, you know, went after the game with energy and, and, and exuberance of, of a championship game. Slick went at it like it was an exhibition game. They beat us by two. So I have no doubt in my mind uh, we, would have been, we would have been very effective uh, playing against NBA teams as we were playing against the NBA teams. Now, when you talk about Slick, you're talking about Bob Leonard, who was the coach. What was he, what was he like to play for? Uh, innovative. Creative, uh, energized. He expected you to work as hard as he. Um, he would change our offense at halftime. But then five or six new plays and expect us to execute them. Uh, he was that. Uh, he played the game the same type of passion he coached. You know? And that's. And I'm not killing guys who didn't play, or guys who were video guys that became coaches. I'm just saying his approach was different. And he turned 12 guys into one, a machine. And that's what we did. I mean, that we played basketball uh, as effectively as we could through him and his passion. You were the director of player personnel for the Pacers until October 2009. There's a couple of radio hosts in this town, Terry Bores and Dan Bernstein, who get on the Pacers who say they have too many white players. What do you say to that? I, I don't. I, I think. I think, you know, if you can play basketball, it wouldn't make any difference if you were chartreuse. That's the whole idea. <laughs> uh, uh, basketball is basketball. I don't think color has anything to do with it. Effectiveness has, but it's what it is. The Boston Celtics had a lot of white ball players. They won. They had Bill Russell, but they still won. The color has nothing to do with it. That's stupid. Uh, to me, I, I don't look at life or basketball or anything like that. If you're good at what you do, I don't give a damn what color you are. It doesn't I- make any difference. I mean, they they ripped Tyler Hansborough saying that he's not athletic, he's not a good player. They ripped Troy Murphy. I'll tell you what, I'll take those guys on my team because they could score, they could rebound, they're team players. Well, the deal with Troy, Troy is much better than Tyler. And, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I love Troy. I named the horse after Murph. Uh, Murph was a rebounder and a scorer. Uh, he adjusted his game, you know, uh, from, he could play on the interior and he could shoot three. Very effective basketball player. Tyler Hansborough, on the other hand, you have to have a guy like him on the team. He plays with passion, and he plays hard. Is he a good athlete? No. Can he handle? No. Is he going to beat anybody off the dribble? No. Can he score off the block? If he's lucky. And this, most of the time, the basket accepts his shot. But if you leave him open for 15 feet, he'll knock that down. But don't put him in a stressful situation because he can't do that. And will he? Because, I, you know, again, I like him, but he's liable to throw the ball in the stand and go jump in the hoop. So I mean, it's just it just his he presents a presence on the floor, not a very good athlete, not a basketball player, basketball player, but somebody that you'd like to have on the team. Did you have a favorite teammate? <sighs> not when I played. No, not really. Uh, I, you know, we had buddies. All of us, all of us, black and white again, were buddies on and off the floor. Uh, you know, and there's certain guys that you, you know, that you, you come with more than others. Roger Brown, Neto, Bob Nellecki, uh Freddie, you know, we were very close. Because my thing was when I was uh, 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 choosing players for, uh, for Larry or Donnie Walsh is, if it don't fit, it won't work. We happen to bring, we happen to, we happen to fit. And the people that were brought in understood for the for the nucleus lot it, with us, and they fit the program that we presented. And Slick made all that happen. So but when if you it don't fit, it won't work. But it happened to fit. When you go in the Hall of Fame, if you could choose, who's going to basically introduce you? Who would you choose? I like to I, I like I like to uh, have Wayne Embry, who will be my initial uh, uh, inductee uh, person that, uh, to introduce me to the Hall of Fame. Because when I was drafted, Wayne was the center. <laughs> in Cincinnati. And he said, if that's getting the SOB, come down here, I'm going to bust him up. <laughs> and then he worked for the Pacers. And I grew to respect him as a man, as a basketball player, and a knowledgeable uh, 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 executive. So. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure is mine. You guys have a good one. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.